Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at the intersection of LGBTQ Street and LDS Avenue. We want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection, but most of all, for joining us in another great uh, podcast episode. And it is a great one, I can assure you. We first want to thank you and those who have helped support the Latter Gay Stories podcast through uh, sharing episodes just like this. We invite you to do that in this episode as well. For those of you who are watching on the video version, we do have an opportunity to have a live chat and to be able to interact back and forth with those who are uh, also watching this episode with you. So take advantage of that. If you are watching on Facebook, you can comment or on our YouTube channel where we are also uh, premiering this episode. You can use the live chat feature to share your thoughts, opinions, and feelings about today's episode. If you are listening on the audio version, wherever that might be, be through Apple, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, iTunes, or one of the other uh, fabulous podcast players. We invite you to subscribe to this channel and to leave us a rating as well. By doing those two simple things, you are helping us to expand the reach of the Latter Gay Stories podcast by providing this podcast, uh, giving this podcast an opportunity to show up in other people's feeds, and um, that helps us to spread the Latter Gay Story word. So thank you. Thank you for those of you who have left a positive rating, for those of you who do share episodes. And I want to thank you just personally for our monthly donors who also are financially supporting the Latter Gay Stories podcast in the, mer the many different uh, ways that you do that. We are so appreciative and so thankful for those of you who do uh, just um, help us to to expand the reach of the podcast, to provide this great studio, the equipment that gets us to um, broadcast episodes just like this, um, and then all of the behind the, scene, behind the scenes things that you don't see that goes into running a podcast. Really, when we started the Latter Gay Stories podcast, um, it was our intention, knowing that this was a gigantic investment into the space, we knew that the Latter Gay Stories audience was worth the investment, and thankfully, uh, many of you have stepped up to help us bear some of those burdens, where no one on no one uh, in the Latter Gay circle uh, is as paid staff at all. We do this just um, to be able to get the stories and experiences out there. So. With that aside, thank you. I do uh, always want to acknowledge those great people who have helped us continue uh, sharing this message. So thank you again. All right, today's episode, what you actually came here for. i uh, super excited. If you've read some of the teasers, it's because um, it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting story like they always are. So I want to thank you for uh, being here to listen to Cray's story, to better understand his experience. I want to take a deep dive into um, into Cray's experience and and his um, his journey out of the closet um, through Mormonism, but also uh, we want to talk about his BYU Idaho experience and what really became a pivotal moment for him um, in changing the trajectory of his of his life and and where that took him. Uh, Cray was. Uh, kicked out of BYU-Idaho. Um, that is an important part of this story. I can imagine, um, you can imagine why he was kicked out, uh, if you understand the context of this podcast episode. Um, because he was living to the fullest measure of his creation, because he was um, being exactly who he was designed to be, the university, at Brigham Young University in Idaho, felt that he... Um, it was not a great candidate for their Mormon school. So we do want to talk a lot about that, and we want to talk about coming out of the closet and um, parents and allies and other people who help support this community. What you can do, and maybe even in Cray's situation, what could have you done to make this a little bit better and a, a little bit easier of a journey um, for him and for others like him. So thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for uh, joining us on this podcast episode. But more importantly, Cray, thank you for joining us um, on this episode and for sharing your story. Um, what part of that little introduction did I miss that I should have talked about? Uh, talk about? Um, um, I think we'll get into it when when we go. So when we take a deep dive, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you uh, for giving us an, uh, a little bit of your time and for being vulnerable and opening up and sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. I I mean, I first want to say like my story's not unique. 
it's a lot of people go through the same thing and um, share my story or a version of my story, but I think it's important to share. So I definitely, uh, uh, probably one of the things that I get the most being on this side of the podcast, the person who does the interviews or sources the interviews is that um, people will always say, but my story, it's not that remarkable. I, <laughs> it, it's, it's just kind of normal. Um, and I remember seeing this a little bit in, in you as well. But um, when, when people get to that point, those are the stories that I'm really interested in. They're remarkably normal uh, because they become so much more relatable. And they're stories that people can cling to because they can look or listen and say, that was me too. And I hope as we maybe venture into your story a little bit more, we're not talking about the masses who have been kicked out of BYU, the masses that went through difficult journeys or points through their coming out experience. Um, but maybe the important part of this episode and episodes like it is that we clear some of those boulders out of the path and help people to have a little bit better um, journey or, or, or opportunity to navigate these waters um, a little less choppy, a little less dangerous. And, and I think your experience will help us do that. Do that. I agree. And, uh, you know, that's why I want to share is to help people um, in the same situation or, or prevent um, situations like mine. Let's do it. Um, for the audience who doesn't know uh, who Craig Casper is about, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, geez, what do you want to know? Everything. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Rigby, Idaho. Um, my family was very Mormon. Um, my parents were divorced when I was five years old. Um, I grew up with step siblings though, and, um, it was pretty good, normal Mormon life. I was expected to, you know, go to church every Sunday and do the things. Be... Let's talk about what that Mormon life looks like. Um, what okay. does the typical Mormon life entail? Um, doing everything that the church asks of you. Um, getting the priesthood, uh, going to the temple, you know, being on a trajectory to get married in the temple, um, worthily and, um, you know, have eternal life. Uh, and, and that means in day to day, like reading scriptures, prayer every day. Um, it also comes with a lot of shame from the culture that uh that people live i think that shame is um relatable mm -hmm. to a lot of people who are listening to uh, podcast episodes like this at what point did you realize i'm different and was it that difference that led to shame or feelings of shame or even guilt yes um I was about 12 years old um, and like my whole life, like when I was five years old, I would dress up in dresses and, you know, want to, want to do girly things. I have four sisters. So my family just thought that I wanted to do that because I had four sisters and wanted to be like them. Um, but it was because I was different. I've realized now and um, about 12 years old is when I started to realize like, no, I have I have feelings for men that I'm told I'm supposed to have for women. Um, Where were a lot of those messages coming from? Um, so maybe a two-part question. Mm -hmm. um, who was feeding you that and giving you those messages? But also who um, was or who were the people that were telling you the dressing up? was the cause of or root of some of that shame? Um, so my family, um, you know, they taught me the doctrine of Mormonism, which is that being gay is not okay. And um, it's a sin. And then they also said like, 
there's a scripture that says something like, if it looks like sin, don't do it or whatever. Avoid the appearance of evil. Yes. Which is something we hear really often in Mormonism. Yes, that. And so if I wanted to dress up, then I was like, I was appearing to be gay and that was not okay. Um, and, you know, it, in Rigby, Idaho, there it's like, 98% Mormon and everyone just, if you're different a little bit, it's terrible. It's, it's not fun. I grew up being bullied for doing theater, for having a higher voice, for, you know, wanting to be me and, um, bullied because people thought that I was gay and they were right. But at the same time, they were bullying me because they thought it was wrong and that it was something to laugh about. I want to unpack this because first off, we're talking about Rigby, Idaho, which is a couple hundred people. Mm, 4,000 ish. A thousand ish. Yeah. Um, so not a gigantic city. Um, Mormon culture this is a lot to unpack. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, because Mormon culture doesn't necessarily on its face lay out how to treat gay people. Like the culture doesn't have a manual that lays out here is how you ostracize the marginalized people, but something within Mormon culture causes its membership to ostracize um, people who are different. And growing up in a small town, I grew up in a small town as well, 175 people. I call it a gay ghost town. Just really nobody there that um, looks, acts, feels, relates to you. And so I know what that's like. And I, and I know what those feelings are like. And I'm sure plenty of people who are listening to this episode can relate to that. But my question is, um, and maybe just in retrospect, like how could that have been different how could your childhood, 12 years old, 13 years old, finally recognizing who and what Cray was or is, what in that little city of Rigby uh, could have changed for the better? Or what are we missing in little cities like Rigby to help young 12-year-old Cray Caspers out there? Teach your kids to be kind and to not bully. I, I mean, Rigby, Idaho in the past year has had uh, a school shooting and um, a potential school shooting they caught before there was a school shooting. Um, and, and these are middle school kids. And I know that, like, I understand those kids. Like, I understand being so much in a pressure chamber of Mormonism and you have to act a certain way, you have to be a certain way. And if you're not, kids will laugh at you. Kids will think you're not a good person. They'll think that you are terrible and you're going to go to hell and they'll tell you that. Like, and I was a Mormon kid and I was trying to be the best Mormon kid Kids just thought I was gay and they bullied me. Like kids who aren't Mormon or aren't trying to be Mormon, like they probably have it worse. And so just teach your kids that like free agency is about you as an individual and you can be kind to others if they're different. Were you willing to come out to anyone at 12 or 13 years old? Did you have language to understand what you were? Oh, absolutely not. I, I hid it for until honestly, after my mission, um, I, I hid it and I, you know, I had issues with pornography, um, but no one knew that it was gay pornography <laughs> and um yeah i i did my best to hide it because i didn't want anyone thinking that i was gay i didn't want to continue to be bullied for being gay 
I good before we segue into that, especially mission, because that's really where we start talking a lot about the deep stuff. I want to talk a little bit about your high school um, experience and and navigating that journey. Um, there are so many young adults who listen to this podcast episode who are on the threshold of coming out or they've recognized and it often does um, we we often know very young five six seven eight years old that something about us is different um, we then usually wait until we're at puberty age after our maturation classes our sex ed <laughs> classes that we start putting the puzzle pieces together to figure out who and what we are um, but high school, junior high school and high school becomes a super formative part of our lives as we start to open up and develop um, these new channels of sexuality and, and understanding um, our own experience. So I want to talk a little bit about that and, and what your experience was like and how you can relate that or how you make that relatable to someone who is coming out today or trying to better understand their sexuality today. Um. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what to do to help those kids because I ultimately was trying to shake off everything gay about me. You know, I did theater, I did choir, but um, I was trying my best to date girls and to, you know, be a good Mormon kid and uh, and everything. And I... I on the inside, I felt so ashamed of who I was. I felt so terrible um, because I had these feelings, um, the same-sex attraction. Um, and so those high school kids, I don't know. I had I had good friends, um, but then again, they were friends who would talk about gay people and how terrible they were, things that they heard from their parents, you know. I had one friend that their family wouldn't let anything gay into their household, like movies and stuff. Like the new Beauty and the Beast was rumored to have like some gay theme or whatever. And they like posted on Facebook that, like they're not going to go see the movie because they don't let anything gay in their, in their household. And I listened to that and I was like, well, then I don't really belong in your household. Like, and these are, are my friend and their family was really good friends with me. Like I love their parents and, um, they liked me and, you know, knew we were good friends and, but then they said that and I like felt more and more ashamed. And I feel like through high school, it was things like that, um, that just kept making me want to push off the gayness <laughs> and push up off everything that's gay about me. And, um, because these were my friends, my best friends, and I wanted to impress them be around them, be the same as them. And I wasn't though. Um, and so I, I think kids who are going through this, like don't listen to those voices who say those things, figure out who you are and love yourself for who you are. And you know, life will be so much easier. You don't have to listen to people who are saying you're wrong because you're not. No one's wrong. God made you the way you are. I think this is probably a great pitch for parents, too, to look at these scenarios and, and kind of dissect what you just talked about and uh, decide whether or not their home is a place where someone like a 13, 14, 15 year old Cray would feel comfortable or 13, 14, 15 year old Kyle would feel comfortable. Um, and trying to determine things that they could do differently within their own home to make their the home a better place for a friend and family who is impacted by this topic. Yeah, and I and I feel like 
that like and when i say like when i was pushing off everything gay about me i mean i was hating myself i was hating who i was i absolutely hated myself what does that hate look like uh shame anxiety i would have panic attacks i i don't know i would do things so that i could seem manly or more masculine i like i said i tried to date girls i wasn't very successful um and you know and and then as well i think i started sharing those same things that people were saying gay people are bad oh yeah i'll like like those gay people are just ruining the world i would say things like that during high school and you know knowing deep in myself that i'm saying that about myself that internalized homophobia is real and you're not the first guest that's been on this episode on, on this podcast that has described that very same feeling um in their own personal episode where they talk about um essentially pitting themselves against themselves and that's a metric that is 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 difficult when we when we realize what we're doing we we are creating a a shell of a shell a shadow within a shadow a fortress within a fortress isolating ourselves from ourselves and it's unhealthy and i and i get exactly yeah. what you're talking about so in high school um you chose to date mm -hmm. um and pretended that you were straight yeah um what was it like and so clearly <laughs> that didn't work for you i'm guessing <laughs> yeah uh no girls really liked me <laughs> i was i mean looking back now i thought that i was acting so straight i thought i was doing so good but looking back now i'm like everyone knew everyone knew that i was gay like i was just trying <laughs> i don't know and and i think that's why you know girls really didn't like me i was too feminine i was um not what their mothers told them to look for <laughs> so yeah just not stereotypical yeah and i um yeah so i want to switch gears just a little bit yes. we talked just a little bit about school um and what it was like there let's talk a little about religion and church what uh what was different or what did you make different about your religious experience to do or cover um, the same way you were doing in your personal and educational life. Were there similar steps? Were, what was the church experience like? Um, let's answer those, then I have another one for you okay. as well. Great. Um, yeah, it was the same. I gave 120% to everything church-related, and I projected that to other people so that they could see that I was righteous and that I was worthy even though I most of my teenage years I technically wasn't um but like click I, click click gay porn click yes, click click okay. exactly um you know and uh, but I projected that I was and and kind of put on a facade that wasn't really me and just you know everyone i was like the priest quorum first um i forget what it's called first assistant yeah that <laughs> you're the first assistant to the bishop yeah bishop yeah. is the president of the priest quorum yeah and i mean i was deacon's quorum president i was teacher's quorum president like all the bishops wanted me to be in leadership positions because i was dependable because i gave my all to everything to every calling and that was me in high school you know i tried to go to the temple to do baptisms for the dead at least twice a month because i was trying to project the shame away and you know try to feel good about myself when i really didn't when you're projecting 
this actually is a really great seg, uh, just a, a good conversation, a good space because um, this is a lesson that I try to help other LGBTQ Latter Day Saints um, analyze better. And I want to talk just a little bit about authenticity and validation and uh, accepting praise. When you're projecting, when you are pretending to be somebody you're not, and the people of your community see your good works, they see your accomplishments, were those really accomplishments to you? Were those acceptable? Um, were those validating experiences? Or was there some part of you that said, if they only knew who I really was, they wouldn't accept me. They wouldn't accept this accomplishment. They, was there anything invalidating about those experiences? Oh yeah. Like it, it was kind of both at the same time. Like, okay, I'm doing good at, at hiding this, but also I'm so ashamed of what I'm doing in secret and how I'm feeling in secret. Um, yeah. So like if, feeling both at the same time and that's really confusing and really complex. And as a teenager, it's hard to really understand, especially when you're, you don't have anyone to talk to about it. And I think it's important to bring up, like, that's not the position a 14, 12, 13 year old kid should be in. No, we have far other things to help them build and, and nourish and sustain and maintain. We shouldn't have to, we shouldn't be feeding our young queer kids this line of thinking um, wasting all of their bandwidth in this space only for them to try to figure out whether or not they survive or thrive. Uh, it's, it's unhealthy. It's unsustainable. And, and I think it's not only for every, it's for every kid. Every kid shouldn't have to Great do point. that. Like, like I remember being pitted against other kids in my quorum for being better or worse, or, you know, we need to reach out to this person because they were not church so now they seem less than me because i was at church and that's every kid that's every person in the church for the whole entire their whole entire lives in the church you're just pitted against each other and if you're not in leadership or not doing well then you're less than everyone else who is it's really a great point um, and I run into this over and over again, and I think it's worth pointing out in this episode and, and others, this sense of, um, of validation and acceptance um, or invalidation when you look at your accomplishments and say, yeah, the person I created achieved those accomplishments, not the person that I really am. The, the person that I really am is behind so many layers of protection, fortress, blocks. Um, and if you really knew, knew who I was, you wouldn't accept me and you wouldn't accept these accomplishments because the cray that I created was the author of these good things. And I think that's really confusing space. And it's a space that we shouldn't be putting our youth and our young people and even our adult um, LGBTQ friends and family members in. Yeah. So many other things we can waste our bandwidth on. This right. shouldn't be one of them. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make the point real quick that, and this is, and this is how my family was like, this is what they were teaching me. For instance, for example, when I was on my mission, my dad didn't say that he was proud of me until I was a district leader until I was a leader of some kind. And I had a stepbrother who's on a mission at the same time, and he may, he was a district leader and a trainer within three months, and it took me a year and a half to be a district leader. And I was still giving 120% the whole time. I was still doing my best. I just, the mission president just didn't assign me to, to do that. And that shouldn't be, there shouldn't be right or wrong of, on that. I feel like I was pitted against my stepbrother because he was doing so well quote unquote and you know but my dad wasn't proud of me until I made that and like that's how my family was growing up um and so I feel like that's what led me to hide everything that's what led me to you know not 
share what was really going on with me. Now you mentioned earlier in the episode that you didn't come out till um, after your mission. So I want to get to the point where you decide that you want to serve a mission um, and kind of a multifaceted uh, discussion because uh, this is familiar territory for many and especially for parents of, of queer kids that are planning on serving missions or currently serving missions. Um, what was that like going into those mission interviews with your bishop, uh, stake president, knowing that you were closeted, knowing that there were things that you could be air quote guilty of doing in your private life that would in some circles disqualify you from serving a mission. What was the mindset? What were you going through? Um, let's kind of walk that path for a minute. Um, so, um, in high school, my friends and I were like the righteous kids. And so that was always the, that was always the path, you know, and, and I have four sisters and then there's me. I'm the only boy in my um, blood family, I guess. I have stepbrothers, but, um, and I was the only one to serve a mission. And that was my whole life. Like throughout my childhood, everything was preparing. My, my parents were preparing me for that. And so it was very expected of me. Um, I didn't want to go on the inside. Like I really didn't. I just like... I think mostly because I, I felt guilty. I felt like I shouldn't be doing this because um, I don't feel worthy enough to be there. And um, But when through all the pornography and everything, I had stopped six months before my actual interviews and, um, you know, became cleared by the bishop. And was that something that you discussed with your bishop that you were viewing pornography? Yeah, it, it, it never, I never said anything about gay pornography, but yeah, pornography. <laughs> and so, you know, I went through the whole repent, repentance process and got cleared. And then, but still those, those interviews with the bishop and with the stake president for the mission are so intense. And I was scared out of my mind, like, I just felt like I'm lying about everything. <laughs> like I'm not actually worthy to go. Um, lying because you weren't sharing the whole truth, the big part of the secret? Or yeah. do you think that there was just, you didn't ever think that you fully repented, that you weren't actually worthy to serve? Well, I thought my mindset and my thinking was that because I had same sex attraction, I was just not worthy. I did not belong there. I could not. And like, there wasn't anything I could do about it. I just wasn't a worthy person. That's, that's what my thinking was is, is because I'm, I have these struggles. Like, it's not okay. <laughs> do you think your bishop or your stake president assumed or? Did you ever hint that you, and I, I mean, we've air quoted this SSA, this same sex attraction, which yeah. is typical Mormon vernacular f for this language. Um, instead of calling someone gay, lesbian, you just suffer or struggle with <laughs> same sex attraction. Um, yeah. did, was that ever brought up in any of your interviews? Do you think your bishop or stake president assumed or thought maybe you were or did? Yeah, uh, I mean, the question was asked, and I always lied. No, I'm straight. I'm 100% straight, and you, that's gross. Like, why would you ask me that? Uh, kind of a of a response. Because, um, again, I was projecting. Um, I only came, like, the first person I ever told was my mission president, because when I was on my mission, I still didn't feel worthy to be there. And then about six months in, we had a, a meeting and my mission president talked about repentance. 
and how if we had anything we needed to repent of that we could call him and I called him I called him after that and I said I struggle with same-sex attraction um, I actually left him a voicemail because he didn't answer and I said I struggle with this and um, if you need to send me home then that's okay um, and he called me back and he said there's nothing wrong with you <laughs> like have you acted on it and I said no and he said having same-sex attraction is not a sin like as long as you don't act on it you're fine what did that mean to young elder casper i was so happy um because i felt finally like validated in my feelings like i had suffered for so many years alone and someone to say like <laughs> it's okay like even though in another context of the church it's not right um but i felt like oh i'm 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 okay you know i'm okay to be here and that just made my mission so much better made me feel better i can imagine it's one thing to have that validation come from a friend a close confidant, someone you care about, but your mission president, like someone in authority, someone who you looked up to, mm -hmm. validating you are not broken. Yeah. It meant a whole lot, and um, it changed my outlook on how the church should view um, gay people and LGBTQ um, communities. And like, it, it, it's, it kind of started the ball rolling in me that, um, you know, it was okay, at least to be that way, not to act on it. Where did you serve your mission? Dallas, Texas. So, um, and, and what years? Um, 2015 to 2017, January. Okay. Did you run into this topic, uh, among people that you taught? Uh, were there other missionaries that you knew were openly out? Cause that's kind of a new phenomena that's happening, um, in Mormonism is a string of, uh, gay missionaries that are currently serving, which I think is incredible for the ability, for visibility, and, and for uh, these young Latter-day Saints who have come out prior to leaving on their missions, who have her openly out in their wards, stakes, branches throughout Zion, and are actively serving. I think it's commendable and incredible and something that I think would have been eerily frowned upon when I was serving my mission. But even oh, in yeah. 2015, were there, did you see gay elders or sisters in the mission field so no, no. Um, now, did you run into that intersection as a missionary teaching people? Oh yeah. Um, well, so another thing my mission president told me is, he said there are other missionaries here who are dealing dealing with the same issue. He never told me who, um, but he said you're not alone. Um, so. I knew, I feel like I'm, I was like kind of the last generation of missionaries who we hit it, <laughs> you know, and that's exciting to hear that, um, missionaries can go out and, and be open about that. Um, but yeah, I did have one person that I taught, um, towards the end of my mission and she was a lesbian and, um, I feel really bad about what happened with her because I basically made her get baptized. Um, and now like we're friends <laughs> and she's, she's left the church and is a lesbian and, and I'm gay and you know, that's exciting, but I, I feel bad for what I made her do. Um, because 
I, th I think I was trying to project on her, um, her repenting would somehow make me f not gay. I don't know. Um, so I really, really tried to get her to do it and she did it. As you're coming out to your mission president, so you, you walk into this mission with so much grief uh, and, and internalized homophobia and shame for who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've come out to your mission president. I'm sure some of that evaporates. Some of that shame, guilt, grief, closetedness, obviously, evaporates out. Uh, does that make you a better missionary? Do you teach with more compassion? Do you see people... Um, honor their experience a little differently, knowing that such a load, such a weight was taken off of your shoulders? I feel like I was, I was better able to focus on what I was doing um, because I didn't have the weight on my shoulders, but I don't think I noticed any change in other people. And 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 in what I was teaching and what I was doing, um, I just kind of felt validated in who I was, and so it helped me just focus more. Did your your relationship with your mission president change at all, uh, for the be for better or f for worse? Um, well, right after that, he made me district leader or district manager. Yeah, district leader. <laughs> I forget. We're not, um, we're not McDonald's. We have district leaders in the mission field, district right. managers. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, so right after that, he made me district leader, so I felt like that was kind of his way of, like, congratulating me for taking whatever step that I did. Um, and then, like, I, I, my relationship with him wasn't, like, the best. I always felt like he liked mission other missionaries more than me because they were sporty and I wasn't <laughs> he was uh almost drafted to be in the NBA and he played at BYU for basketball and everything so he's a big sporty guy and he definitely valued his sports player missionaries uh more than the theater kids or the others but i guess suffice to say you weren't you weren't ostracized you didn't feel like coming out to your mission president was the worst decision that you could have made no um and like in my exit interview we talked about it again and he basically told me to go home and get married and that my problems would go away <laughs> Which you know, is this, this is territory false. that I definitely want to spend a little time in. Yes. <laughs> um, and I hope every Latter-day Saint bishop, uh, mission president, potent, potential mission president, anyone who counsels uh, queer youth in the church pays attention to this next section. Uh, and exit interviews, tell us a little bit about what a exit interview is uh, as a missionary. Um, so actually, that's the beginning of my play that I'm writing is my exit interview um sorry <laughs> but um yeah so basically you go throughout your mission you meet with your mission president every now and again um, and then your exit interview you talk about what the mission was like for you what um things you're going to continue doing that'll lead you down the path of righteousness um and you know what your plans are after your mission and then he wishes you good luck, and then you go home. Gives you a little bit of advice, and then sends you on an airplane and boots you out of the mission. Yep. What advice uh, did your mission president give you? Now you said he said this was going to go away. I want to. <laughs> I really want to dissect this. Give us all of the promises. Give us all of the the reasoning. Um, the things that your mission president told you. He knew you were gay. Um, you come out to him. So, what what advice uh, for good? or bad did your mission president give? Um, well, we were talking about what I wanted to do in my life, and I said, I want to teach theater. Um, and he said, mm, being in the theater industry might make it worse. 
for you, you might want to think about doing something else. Um, and I said, oh, well, okay. Um, it's kind of weird advice, but all right. Um, and then um, he said, and I mean that be because stereotypically theater people are gay and, uh, you know, whatever, it might be bad for me to go. One would assume he's telling you to find a more manly profession. Yeah, exactly. Um, which that, anyway, that was a crazy story after that anyway. But I went back to theater. Um, sorry. <laughs> he, he, he then talked to me about, you know, my same sex attraction and about, you know, as long as I don't act on it, I'll be fine. And that if I go home and get married as soon as possible in the temple to a woman, that it would just go away. That I wouldn't really struggle with it anymore. Was that message from your mission president believable? Did you feel the spirit of what he was saying? Was there something inside of you that said, he's right, and if I do this, it'll go away? Well, I had been teaching that to people for two years. Um, I had kind of convinced myself that that's what would happen, and that, and that because I had worked so hard on my mission that you know, God was going to help me out and make it go away. Um, so I, I was like, yeah, you know, you know, I may like have attractions here and there, but like it would go away. Like that's kind of what I thought. Not just manageable, but this goes away. Yeah. Never have to worry about it again. Yeah. I think familiar. That is, uh, it's a response that is familiar with many gay Latter-day Saints who, um, Sometimes we see this ahead of serving a mission. Uh, this sometimes happens when uh, elders or sisters are preparing uh, and, and working with their bishop or stake president. They start making deals with God, and they'll start to say, or even mid-mission or the beginning of your mission, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z if you do A, B, C for me. Mm -hmm. um, did you... Did you go into your mission making those deals or did you ever think that that exit interview was an opportunity for you to make a deal with God? Look, I gave you two years of my life. I, I was all in a hundred percent. I did all of the right things. I was as righteous as I could have been. Now it's your turn. It's your turn to make this mission president right. And it's your turn to um, uphold his testimony through the spirit and make this happen. Yeah. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And, you know, that, that was my mission experience. Like, I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can so that this will go away. Uh, I was making deals with God every single day, you know. But. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, did it happen? <laughs> uh, it wasn't true. It, it turned out to be wrong. I, I struggled more with it, probably, because of what was said to me. Um mostly because I thought, well, did my, I'm still feeling these feelings. Did my hard work not work? And then that makes me feel even more not worthy. And it's just a cycle and a, and a tunnel of just bad. <laughs> Cyclical shame. Yeah. Yeah. It is the epitome of um, insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting this different result, and you still were who you always have been. Yeah. And nothing was changing. Yeah. You come home from your mission. Uh, do you enroll in school? Do you take some time off? What, what was your life like? Um, so I had done a semester at BYU-Idaho before my mission, so I just went straight back to BYU-Idaho after that. And I... Tried to take my mission president's advice, and I took a whole bunch of different classes to see what I wanted to do other than theater. And I wanted to do theater, and so I did. Um, and so I guess that you could say that maybe that was uh, the advice that I didn't take and maybe why I struggled so much 
I guess people could look at it that way if they wanted to be mean. Um, but theater inherently isn't gay. It's, it's about storytelling. It's about um, telling people's stories and, and creating compassion. It's, a, it's art. It's an art form. Um, I just happen to be gay and to like theater and to want a career in theater. So you're um, you're now newly enrolled again mm -hmm. at BYU Idaho mm -hmm. Theater Program, embracing a little bit of this part of you, um, which had to have required you to have some type of a disconnect with the authority, the spiritual experience with your mission president. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little a little bit about that um, path. At what what now? clicked or was the impetus to say i need to be true to who i am um, not what other people think i should be um okay so well three weeks after i got home i was back to watching pornography um and i thought well i want to say swear word. well crap <laughs> um i I didn't do it, you know, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And then that just kind of like brought me into depression and then cycled more into por pornography and everything. So I was doing that and struggling with that, talking to my bishop every single time that it happened. Um, at this point, I had told my my mom and a couple of my sisters that I had struggled with same-sex attraction and, um, you know, that I wasn't sure what that all meant and I was trying to figure it out and trying to, you know, fight it. And um, my mom would always tell me, fight it, just keep fighting it and, you know, you'll, you'll get there. What did that mean to you? Uh, she says, fight it. Was there an underlying meaning to that was that did that translate different to you well my mom thought that what i wanted was a temple marriage with a woman and so if i fought fought what i was feeling then and won then i could have that and you know i thought that too um in some shape and form, but also I was dealing with the complex feelings that I was are all also having with being gay. And like, I didn't actually, I tried to date right as I got home, but I just couldn't, I couldn't date girls. I couldn't do it. And so I, you know, I, because I was, I felt so guilty. I, I like that yeah. you bring that part of it up because the immediate response in the religious community is that, well, clearly, Cray, you didn't try hard enough. If you really wanted to change, if you really wanted to live up to the expectations of your Father in Heaven and the promises of your patriarchal blessing and the, uh, the spiritual witnesses of your mission president, then you would have tried a little harder and you would have actually tried to date. Uh, you just kind of failed and you just gave up. You didn't try hard enough at all. I did though. I tried and I fought it as hard as I possibly could. When I was worthy enough, I would be at the temple every week. I, you know, was reading my scriptures, praying as hard as I possibly could. And like there was one girl that I started going on dates with and like the next step would be to be a couple. Uh, and then I ended up ghosting her because she was amazing. She is amazing. She's an amazing person. And I just, at that point I was like, I can't do that. I can't, I can't give a hundred percent of myself to her because I'm not really attracted to her. And that's not fair to her. And I just said, peace out. Like, I got to figure this out. And that that moment was kind of, was, that's when I started really thinking, 
is what I've learned my entire life really real and really okay. And then I started giving in to, I didn't go to my bishop as much, and I just, you know, let my feelings be and, you know, not feel guilty for watching pornography and not feel guilty for looking at a guy and being like, dang, he's cute. And that's released me from years and years of shame and grief. And I felt so, I felt happy. Like I felt a new sense of energy and just excitement about the world. But it was also really confusing to me because I'm like, but this is not what I was taught that is okay. And so I was dealing with this really confusing time. And then they called me to be elders quorum president in the YSA. And I told the bishop, I didn't tell him that I wasn't worthy. I just said, you know, I'm kind of going through a faith crisis right now. Like, I don't know if I'm the best person for this. Um, and he said, well, God told me it was you. So there must be something you need to learn. And so I was like, okay. So I became elders corn president. And I, I, I told myself, this is, this is my last try to fight it. And I gave my all to being elders corn president, but I was also trying to figure out why I felt so happy just accepting myself. Um, and I realized, you know, the church isn't for me. What, what it's taught about being gay isn't for me. And I, you know, I had a year left at BYU, Idaho. Um, and so I said, I, I have a year and then after that, I can do whatever I want. So this is the grin and bear portion of your college life. And, and mm. this is really the familiar discussion that we have around church schools. It's so prevalent in the news right now with what's happening at Brigham Young University, both the Provo, Utah campus and the BYU-Idaho campus and the BYU-Hawaii campus, where students are expected to live a code of conduct called the Honor Code. Um, that requires them to, it re regulates everything from whose hand they can hold <laughs> to whether or not you can have hair on your face. That is the honor code. That is the length and breadth of uh, the church's regulation on its uh, student population. So you're saying that you you basically looked at this situation and said, I've got a year's, year left. Um, I grin and bear. I just buckle down, obey all the rules, and make BYU-Idaho a memory in my rearview mirror. But that's not really what happened. That's not really what happened. Um, and, like, I think when I say I have a year left, I was also like, I have a year to figure out if I want to leave the church, if I want to be gay, uh, what I want to do, you know? And that was what was like, okay, you know? It was also really confusing and really, like, brought me down a lot because I, I would just think about this nonstop. Um, anyway, so what happened was I got an internship at a summer theater and um, one of my professors is the owner of the theater, and um, I was the stage manager, um, which meant that I basically managed everything behind the scenes, uh, everything, like, <laughs> and um, it was in kind of a secluded area, and some things happened where the cast kind of didn't like me. Um, and so I felt really, really alone. And I, I was very, very extremely alone and went into a very, very deep depression. Um, um, I finally accepted that I'm gay. 
and um you know what what am i going to do did that acceptance include coming out to other cast members anybody outside of your just family circle um so n no <laughs> but um and this is where it gets the story gets deep deep derailed i don't know um i met one of the designers and he was going through a lot with because he was gay and but he had a family he was older and um you know going through a lot and we ended up working together because he was a set designer and i knew how to paint sets and so we spent a lot of time t together and talking about this and that and then he started getting deep with me about how he was feeling and i ended up coming out to him as well um and we just kind of had a shared experience and it was good we were friends um and then later that summer uh he told me that he liked me and we started an affair <laughs> that's the word for it um and yeah then it got really interesting um my professor this is this is what is really hard because my professor and I had a really, really good relationship. Um, he was going to mentor me in, in a lot of things in theater. And they would say things like, we love you here. You always have a job here. You're like our second son. Um, you're always welcome in our home. Um, because I had, I had talked to them about how no one in my family really understood why I was doing theater and, um, things like that. And they're like, well, we can be your theater family and be, you know, those people for you. And, um, some stuff happened and they found out that we were more than like, they didn't find out that we were in a relationship, but they found out that like we were a lot better friends than they expected and they knew he was going through this um and so they suspected and the day after the season ended i had moved home and i got a call from the honor code office saying we want to meet with you and there's two ways an honor code office finds out about things like this um the least uh traveled path is self-reporting we've heard a little bit about that in the news lately with a byu student who claims to have self-reported um, the other is that someone rats you out uh, or tells on you um, and that someone can be your ecclesiastical leader your bishop stake president but often a roommate often a friend sometimes a professor will notify the honor code office and let them know that they should investigate a particular student for a particular violation. Yeah. So that's what happened. Uh, my professor called the honor code office or so I was told that's what I was told that it was my professor. It, the honor code office didn't tell me that it was this guy that I was dating. He said, well, they found out and he called. So, I don't know because the story gets terrible after this. I don't know if it was him who called so that he could get out of a relationship that he didn't want or what, uh, but he told me it was the professor and that just like, it was a big betrayal. And now looking back, I understand why they did it. Um, and I want to be clear that my choice i know was a big mistake the affair the affair it was not good i was i was wrong um it was a mistake 
and I know that now, <laughs> and I'm very, very sorry to the people that I hurt um, for making that choice, but at, at the time, he was offering me the world. He was offering me everything I ever wanted. He was telling me like that we could have a life together, that we could, you know, have a family and be happy. And at that point, that was what I wanted. And there wasn't anything else. Everything else was just sad to me. And so I, I felt like I didn't have any other choice. Um, But this professor felt, so it felt like a betrayal because, and now it, it's just tender because they sent me to the wolves. I, I dropped out of BYU-Idaho so I didn't have to go through the witch hunt of the honor code office because I broke the honor code. I really did. And there was no getting past that. Um... And that meant that, you know, I wouldn't graduate in a year um, like I was planning on. Like this, and this guy like told me like, if you, if you go back to school, I'll pay all of your bills, like everything. Like this is the stuff that he was offering me. He was offering me to like pay for a surrogate so I could have my own child. Like stuff like this. Like as I listen to this, and it just might not even be completely correct, but I just like, it just screams grooming, 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 grooming at every angle. Oh yeah. And I was so young, like, like, I mean, it was only like three years ago, but I was a kid then. And I've been through so much now that I feel like I'm an adult and I can look back and be like, wow, that was crazy. But I, I was, I was a kid. I had no idea what I was doing. And it's true. Like he, he was manipulating me. He was telling me to do things that I didn't necessarily wanted to do. But like, if I did, we'd be together. Um, like I paid for hotels for us so that we could stay and I didn't have any money. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he, he would just, <laughs> anyway, it was abusive. Um, and it became very, very abusive. We were together for a few months. I stayed with my parents until I was able to get enough money to get my own apartment so he could come see me. Um, so this relationship, it extended past your exit from BYU Idaho. Yeah. Well, because that was the only thing I had. I didn't have anything else. My family knew because I all of a sudden wasn't at BYU Idaho anymore and I had to give them a reason. And I thought I was happy, so I just told them the truth. And they didn't support it whatsoever because it was not right. Um and so, like, I was way disconnected from my family. I was disconnected from my friends at BYU-Idaho because I didn't want to tell them what was going on. I had one friend who I told who's amazing and who got me through all of this. Um, but, like, I didn't have anything other than him. And so it was manipulative. It was abusive. It was wrong it was you know but I couldn't not be a part of it because the alternative was having nothing I think the question on everyone's mind how do you break out of this how do you rise above this how do you make a wrong become right um well a few months into the relationship he texts me while I'm at work and just says I can't do this anymore. And like that, like I was already having panic attacks about everything and 
um, and everything. And uh, my friend was support supportive for me at the time. Like I thought she was supportive, but she was really trying to go me out of getting out of this relationship and, um, and like putting thoughts in my head of, you know, maybe you should go back to school or, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing for you. Um, but after he broke up with me, he still wanted to come around to have sex and bring other people around and which I wasn't comfortable with but I did it anyway so I could see him and it was just not okay um and at that point I was like I'm just so miserable like it's okay if I have nothing because I can make something for myself I can go back to school and those thoughts started happening and I knew, like, this isn't going to last, and this is, you know, it's not good. Um, and then COVID hit. And I was furloughed from my job, so I spent two months at home by myself. And, like, at the very beginning, I was like, well, this is great. Now you can come over whenever you want. And he didn't say anything to me for about a week. And then he's like, oh, yeah. And then, but at that time, I was like, I had had so many panic attacks over him not answering that I was like, this isn't a life to live. This isn't the life I want to live. And so COVID, I had just gotten into Weber State, and I decided I'm not going to wait for my lease to to end in August, I'm going to move now. And I moved to Utah during COVID, and I started classes online at Weber State. Just, I just did it. I Clean just sweet. did it. I just got out of there. And I saw him one, one last time so I could give him his stuff back and call him a dirt bag. And that was it. Um crazy and and because of that because i left byu idaho i graduated about two and a half years later than when i was supposed to um which was a few months ago and that graduation meant so much to me because of all of this that i've been through um and i did all that while working a full-time job and trying to get over the trauma, lots of therapy. I'm still not perfect. <laughs> uh, I have panic attacks all the time. Things set me off, trigger me all the time, but I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy that I'm gay. And uh, something that was really important for me to be able to figure out was that this abusive relationship is not the same as me being gay. It was never the same. I, I kind of jumbled them together. My family jumbled them together. Um, but I had to separate that, that being gay was good. It was what was making me happy and giving me the happy feelings about the situation. The situation was not okay. Um, and so I've, since then I've come to like, really understand what being gay is, is is all about and what that means for me and i'm a lot happier that way where I, I i love that this is how you've kind of framed bookend this story um what does that happiness look like and and what advice do you have for someone who is walking this path right behind you maybe in or out of a, an abusive toxic relationship uh because that's something that we don't spend very much time talking about. And I appreciate you being vulnerable to bring up something that in 100 of 100 other stories would be uncomfortable and uh, difficult to talk about. Why bring up such a vulnerable part of your story to such a global audience? I don't want it to happen to anyone else. What I have been through is... 
I do not want anyone else to have to go through. I don't want those naive kids at BYU right now to get themselves into the same situation. It's not okay, and it has messed me up. And that's why I feel like I need to share, because you can pull yourself out of it. You can be your hero and do it for you and live your life for you and be authentic. And you don't need a relationship. You don't need that abusive person. You just need you and to feel happy and love yourself. What does the future look like for Cray? What What do you see down the road? What are you, um, what are you looking for? Well, I'm single still. <laughs> He's looking for a husband. He's looking for <laughs> yes. someone to date. Okay, so we got that. Yes, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> um, but ultimately, like... Like I've said, I, I still struggle, even though I'm really happy with, with who I am and I feel really calm with being gay and being outside of the church and not a member anymore, um, which is also an important part of the story. Um, but um, I just am excited to... continue to figure out myself and to um, overcome the PTSD that I have and panic attacks and anxiety and depression that I still very much struggle with, um, but I'm getting better every day because of this experience. Um, I'm getting better every day and I, I'm excited for that future where I, I've, I've made something for myself. I've have a career that I want and that I love that and that I, I can share my story with people. I, I kind of mentioned before I'm writing a play about, um, my experience and what I'd like to do is not only, have it be about my experience, but about gay Latter-day Saints experience and, and our shared experience as um, the things that we've gone through and write a play and perform it and, and have people come and watch it and understand, wow, that's what it's like. And maybe, maybe they can be kinder <laughs> and more understanding because it's hard. And maybe they bypass so many of the boulders, uh, are able to jump over a lot of the potholes mm -hmm. that you went through down the side, explored the bottom, climbed back out again. And that's a familiar story that so many of us had to uh, navigate. Um, and the road is getting calmer. It is getting uh, easier to navigate there are fewer boulders in this path mm -hmm. but they still exist and the reality is that it uh it is still uh sometimes probably the rarest time i ever used the word struggle mm -hmm. the struggle really is in pushing some of those boulders off of the path um after we've learned how to deal with them right a after we've moved past them then it's kind of the principle of securing your own oxygen mask before helping other people. Um, when we're in a good spot, it gives us the chance to push all that away and make the path a little easier for other people. As we wrap the podcast, what haven't we talked about that you wanted to talk about? Any key points that we didn't bring up um, that you think the audience should know? Um, yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, one... Um, a lot of people say, 
if you don't want to go to BYU or BYU Idaho, like if you don't want to follow the rules, just go to a different school. And I have such a hard time hearing that because for me, in my experience, I was trying. The reason I went to BYU Idaho was so that I could get rid of this, get rid of being gay so that I could stay on the righteous path. And I found out while I was there and in personal discovery and growing up that I couldn't do that. And so, and I feel like that's the story with a lot of students. They go because it's cheap. They go because their parents want them to. They go because it'll be a place where they, they can be worthy. Um, and then after a couple years of being there, they figure out, no, I'm gay. Um, and that's not really with the honor code. And after that, they're stuck. Like after a couple of years, you're stuck being there because number one, I'm going to tell you, like my tran my credits didn't transfer at all, really to this new school. Oh, that's, that's why I ended up spending two and a half years longer. Um, it also cost me a lot more money to transfer. It cost me about $20,000 more in student loans and to transfer. So students are wary of that. They don't want to transfer because of that. They don't want to transfer because their family would disown them all these different things. It's not an issue of just go to a different school. It's an issue of the school just is mean and rude to people and, and it's not okay. Like that, stop asking, stop saying, just go to another school. I think it's, you can't. Yeah. I think it's key to point out that, um, the latest ruling from the department of education uh, through its civil rights division, through the civil rights investigation, was that BYU is strongest when it affirms its ability and its power to discriminate. What BYU recent and there was just recently a, a civil rights case that was brought against BYU. Um, an LGBTQ student at BYU challenged the school's uh, ability to determine whether or not he could date or they could date. Um, and the Title IX provisions under BYU grants them the opportunity to discriminate. And, and BYU expressly uh, acknowledged their ability to discriminate against protected classes, namely uh, LGBTQ students. So I, I hear what you're saying, that BYU is a place that uh, is fond of its ability to marginalize and discriminate against LGBTQ students. Um, whether or not we agree that that is uh, legal, it seems to be legal, but is it the right thing? It is, is it what Mormonism would classify as do what is right, let the consequences follow? Is that the right thing to do? Mm. We can all personally answer that question. I mean, for me, it's no, absolutely not. And I, I think like these students are stuck there. Like, they may not have an experience like me where they have to leave, um, but they're stuck there until they end. And then they just go, but they go through the same thing of, of being depressed and feeling these complex feelings. And, and if they just had a safe place to figure out themselves, they wouldn't have to potentially come to these situations like mine. They wouldn't have to potentially go through trauma. <laughs> no, I think that's I think that's a great point. And to the listener who is listening to this episode or watching this episode, you are the safe place. You are the resources. You are the group of people who will affirm and create places where BYU craze can come out and feel okay and find solid footing and find the necessary support to allow him and others like him to thrive. 
were, I mean, given that we had this whole expansive experience, which side of the aisle have you found the most joy living on? Was this worth it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I am so happy being gay and so happy accepting myself. I feel like I would have gotten there if I didn't go through this experience. This experience made it a lot quicker. <laughs> And added a lot of trauma. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm happy where I am right now. I'm happy that I have an ability to make my life the way I want it to be. Um, and I'm happy that I get to share my experience so I can help other people. Um, to borrow um, a quote from Paige, who I think was three episodes ago or so, cages or wings, which do you prefer? Wings. Oh, yeah. And I, like, I have them. Like, I'm not caged anymore. Um, that feels good. I think it's the best way to end this episode. Yeah. I prefer wings as well. <laughs> the quote is from Tick, Tick, Boom. Oh, I love that. Uh, cages or wings? Let the birds decide or ask the birds. Yeah. And I think uh, every day of the week, it's wings. It's the ability to fly and the ability to um, rise above, stand, um, be okay with the beautiful, intrinsic, uh, creative, sometimes eccentric <laughs> aspects of who we are yeah. uh, in all varieties of who we are. I think that's the beauty of humanity and that's the beauty of, of better understanding this experience is that there is no one way to be gay. There is no one way to be Mormon. Uh, there is no one way to follow this path in uh, exact perfection. But it is a path that we navigate and it's a path that we we fall on and we stand back up again and we keep moving forward. I think your story has been a, a powerful example of, of moving forward and of better understanding the importance of progression and allowing ourselves to become stagnant uh, means that we don't move forward. And, and it's often that means we sulk and we stop. And, and especially in this space, we need to move forward and we need that opportunity to shine and, and to do um, and become something a little bit more, be a little better and a little bit more prominent. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, thank you for being vulnerable and for giving the audience a glimpse into your world and into your life. For those who are watching this episode and listening to it, um, and they, uh, some who might, might have questions, are you willing to answer, field some of those questions? Oh yeah. Uh, share some more tidbits, nuggets of advice. Absolutely. Is that something you're willing to do? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think like I, there's so much more that I could share, um, but I mean, we're only limited to an hour <laughs> and you know, there's more parts to the story that, that are, make it more complex and make it, um, you know, more relatable, but, and I'd love to share, you know, and give advice. So Perfect. So for those questions. of you, yeah. So for those of you who are watching um, on our Facebook or YouTube channels, we invite you to share your question and, and I'll make sure that Cray is there um, to answer your questions on our social media, even after this premieres as well, because for, I mean, I, I still get questions from episodes that aired years ago. So people still pay attention to those and, and there are ways that we can keep the audience connected with uh, each person who has shared their story. So that, that invitation is open to you as well. If you are watching or listening to this episode and want to reach out to Cray as well, uh, let's do it through social media or just send me a personal message. I'm sure they can always look you up on social media as well. Oh, yeah. You're not too hard to find on Facebook. Yeah, especially if you want to date. It's great. Oh, yeah, you you got to make sure that's in there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These little giddy-giddy gumdrops back there. <laughs>
<laughs> That's had, exciting. I had to bring that in, you know. <laughs> I'm excited for you, Craig. I'm excited for your future. Thank you again for uh, being vulnerable and sharing this portion of your story that I that I know is difficult. And it's hard to talk about the, the parts of our story that um, required some stitches and required a little triage. Uh, but I think being open and, and candid and vulnerable about these parts of our story is what moves the needle and what helps draw... Uh, empathy and compassion uh, towards people and this topic every day of the week. So thank you. Thank you. It's episodes like this that help us to better understand these experiences. And I thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection. If you, uh, again, felt something um, from this episode, if you learned something from this episode, we invite you to share it. We, we would love for you to share this episode or even make a comment um, where, where you listened or watched this episode. And it allows us to expand our reach to uh, your friends and circle, especially on social media, who uh, have, have those people who have not yet uh, caught this episode or others. And we invite you to do that. It really does help us to, um, to share the word and to get these episodes out there. So thank you for doing that. If you are listening on the audio version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and also to leave us a rating. We always promise subscribing to the channel gets you these episodes just a little bit earlier than the video versions. So that's always a perk of having uh, your little device, whether it's your mobile, your phone, your computer, tuned uh, and subscribed to our channel, whether it's on Apple or Stitcher, or iTunes, or, uh, Google, uh, iHeartMedia, or one of the other podcast players. We are everywhere you find and catch your favorite podcast episodes. You will get it a little bit sooner. Um, so thank you. Thank you for giving us uh, a little bit of your time to uh, better understand Cray and Cray's experience. We also want to give a big shout out to those who have financially uh, supported and helped the Latter Gay Stories podcast. If you want to make a donation, we invite you to do that on our website at LatterGayStories.org. You can click on the donate tab and make a monthly or one-time donation. We are also Venmo friendly at Latter Gay Stories if you want to kick us a donation that way. They um, are always appreciated, uh, and we use the funds to continue providing stories just like this to you and the Latter-Gay Stories community. Again, thank you. Uh, we will have another episode coming up. This and others are available online at LatterGayStories.org, on our Facebook channel, and also our, our Facebook page, and also on our YouTube channel. It's stories like Craze and yours that help us to, to continue writing your own Latter-Gay Stories.